Welcome everyone and thank you all for waiting just a couple minutes. We'll, I'm sure that we'll have some more people um, joining in as well. Uh, this is our first in what we will do as a series really of Bronco wellness chats. And today, of course, you all signed up for um, financial wellness and we are with a fellow alumna, Kelly Long. Um, before I jump into that kind of thing, I should introduce myself. So I'm Carolyn Smith and I am Assistant Director of Alumni Relations for Western. So we welcome all of you and thanks for joining. We are recording this um, and we'll make it available to you and to those who are not able to join today. And because of that, I'll just ask that everyone keep your mute and even your video hidden for the time being. But of course, a little bit later, we, you are invited to ask any questions. We want you to be actively involved. And if you would rather put questions in the chat, I'll be watching that as well. Um, I should also add, and thank you, Kelly, for reminding me of this, that the information discussed today is intended for general guidance and educational purposes only and should not be construed as individual advice. And you can explain that later if you'd like to. But um, with that, I, I'm excited that we were able to partner with the Sanford Center for Financial Planning and Wellness for these first two sessions. And their program manager, Todd, has generously volunteered to lead these sessions so that I have the opportunity to learn along with our alumni. Um, and our alumni expert for today's session is Kelly Long, who is a certified financial planner, professional, and financial, financial wellness coach. So as you might have read in the description, she's dedicated her career to helping people feel better about money through education and empowerment, um, and has been quoted on many different channels. So we'll, we'll let her talk about that as well. But her overall goal, as I read, has been to provide unbiased resources and advice to help you find your own version of financial bliss. So thank you, Kelly. We're really excited um, to have you here. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Todd now. And Todd, if you don't mind, just briefly before you start, can you tell everyone about the Sanford Center? And sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am uh, the program manager, as Carolyn said, of the Sanford Center for Financial Planning and Wellness. And yep, it's a mouthful, but uh, we uh, are here to help students um, in a variety of ways. We offer financial coaching. We help students by improving financial literacy. And then we do outreach in the community to promote financial literacy. And then um, the, the, uh, one of the other missions of the, of the center is, is to promote financial planning as a career option for students. And so uh, we work, I'm part of the um, finance and commercial law department. So we wanna promote um, financial planning both as a career option, but also as a, uh, as a behavior amongst <clears throat> people so that they can improve their lives uh, in their, uh, through their better financial practices. And so with that, um, I'm excited to have Kelly here. I met uh, Kelly uh, ooh, earlier, oh, about a year ago or so. And um, from, from our initial meeting and moving forward, and she's done uh, presentations for the Sanford Center and students here at Western, um, I have just come to really admire the work she's done and uh, her expertise in this area. And so with, with that, I'm, I'm wondering, Kelly, if you want to give a little bit of your background, but also... Kelly um, is uh, one of the people that uh, had not only can really talk the talk, but also has walked the walk. And so from the standpoint of people who have really done uh, a lot in their personal life as far as uh, financial planning and um, you know, financial improvement, um, Kelly has also done that. So I will turn it over to you, Kelly, for that. Thanks, Todd. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Um, class of 2000 from the uh, Hayworth College of Business. Uh, I graduated with an accountancy degree um, back before financial planning was really even kind of a recognized profession and definitely before I knew really anything about financial planning. Um, so I've had a very interesting 20 plus year career. Um, during my time at Western, I actually went to Western on a medallion scholarship for engineering and changed my um, 
major second semester of freshman year after I had to take a physics with a lab. <laughs> so, um, and I, I remember going to the library and looking up what, what profession I could still graduate in four years, because that's when my scholarship ran out, and still get a good job, and accounting was it. So, um, you know, I've had a bit of an accidental career, um, and that's really informed all of my, especially the last 10 years or so of my career. Uh, you know, I, I had a full ride to Western, and I still graduated with $15,000 worth of student loan debt and $8,000 worth of credit card debt. Um, and $15,000 was a lot 20 years ago for any of you that might've been in school at the same time. Um, it wasn't unmanageable, but when my student loans kicked in six months after graduation, even though I had a great job at Deloitte, I had to get a roommate and eat ramen for two weeks while I waited for her to move in because I had completely stretched myself too thin financially. And through a series of uh, really kismet type interactions, um, including being laid off a year after into my career, um, after 9-11, Deloitte culled about five people from their staff, and I was one of them. Um, I kind of wandered into the wealth planning and wealth management world and worked for a couple banks. Um, I actually went to Cincinnati out of school, and there I had exposure, direct exposure to people who had significant wealth. Um, either people who were beneficiaries of trusts, whose maybe grandparents, I worked with a family whose grandfather had incorporated Procter & Gamble and was paid in stock. So as you can imagine, that, that trust was worth many millions worth of dollars. And so his you know, grandchildren really didn't have to work, but they didn't know squat about money and money was a constant source of anxiety. And I, I continued to observe this with, um, with lots of my clients, no matter how much money they had or how much money they were, they made. And, um, you know, Todd and I were talking beforehand about the concept of, of, uh, wealth is really more about your savings rate and not necessarily about how much you make. And it took me a long time to really articulate that, but I went in search of a way to help people doing that. And so through a series of trial and error, I landed at my most recent job, which was as a financial wellness coach for a company called Financial Finesse. And Financial Finesse offers financial coaching to uh, employees of large corporations. So if you are work, work for like Nestle or General Mills or Viacom or even the NFL, your company pays for you to call and talk to a CFP. And I was one of those CFPs and we didn't sell any products. So it was like the best job ever because I could answer people's questions and help them with financial planning without any need to either sell them a product or have them pay me a fee. And that really allowed us to have very frank conversations and allowed people who might not normally have access to expert advice on money, uh, get that access. So that was a, a really awesome career move for me. And like Todd said, I, I kind of walked the talk and this summer um, had achieved a level of financial security that um, allowed me to leave my job. And so my personal definition of financial freedom is making choices in life for every reason but money. So when the job was no longer working for me, I was able to stop working the job. So I'm actually kind of doing freelance work and uh, figuring out what my next move is going to be, taking kind of a mini retirement. And that kind of informs a lot of the work I do as well, knowing that most people my generation and younger aren't, I mean... I guess people younger are, have never been motivated by saving for retirement, but it's more important now than it was 20 years ago because of the lack of um, pensions and, and companies taking care of employees. It's on us to prepare for the future. But if I were to tell somebody right out of college, I got to save for retirement, unless they you know graduated from the Stanford Center or were very money motivated, that just sounds like a pipe dream. And so um, I do envision us seeing more of these kind of mini retirement sabbaticals, taking time away mid-career. Um, a lot of people have done it in the past and called it being a stay-at-home parent, but um, ironically, people still have a harder time understanding why I might leave my job without having to be a stay-at-home parent. I'm like, well, it's actually less risky <laughs> because I don't have any mouths to feed besides my own and I'm married. So my husband, uh, you know, he, he has a, an income right now, but I would love for him to be able to step away if he wanted to as well. So all that to say that I think mindset work around money is probably just as important, if not more important than knowing how to do the basics and how to invest properly and how to save properly. But we'll talk a little bit more about kind of that stuff um, as we go. 
Thanks, Kelly. Um, so uh, given some of the turmoil with the pandemic and some of the other things that have, have gone on, going into 2021, what do you think uh, would be some maybe best practices or things people should be thinking about doing uh, for this upcoming year and, and maybe in the, in the near future? Well, I always encourage people to keep the big picture in mind. So, um, cause there's always something when I think back to, you know, 2018 and what my anxieties were, there was, there was something that we were worried about. Um, so there's always going to be something, some uncertainty in the short term. And the best thing you can really do to prepare for that is first of all, set yourself up so that if you do have an unexpected disruption to your cash flow, there's as little long-term disruption to your lifestyle. And all that really means is having the, the classic emergency fund. Um, and you know the rule of thumb is three to six months, sometimes more, um, sometimes less. And, and the exact amount will really depend on the rest of your financial situation and your personal circumstances. You know, my friend Greg, who is the sole income provider for four children and a, a wife and two of his kids are in college, has to keep a lot more cash on hand in case something happens to him than you know my friend Joe, who still lives at home, is 25, doesn't really have a lot of debt. You know, like if he were to lose his job, he wouldn't really need a lot of cash except for like to pay a cell phone bill. So um, it's it's really a matter of kind of adjusting for your life. That kind of foundation of just knowing you could weather some type of disruption is can help you become or more comfortable with uncertainty and then keep the big picture in mind. So you're not reacting to, you know, market falls and drops and you just stay the course for the big picture stuff. But, you know, there are some opportunities right now to take advantage of for, for example, you know, as you, if you have student loans, you probably know that federal student loan payments are paused for the rest of the year. And hopefully you've already kind of thought through the decision. Should you continue to pay them and pay them down faster? Or should you take that opportunity and divert those uh, payments to some other goal? Um, that's really a, depends on your personal situation. If you have higher interest debt or you haven't yet built up your emergency fund, it's a great opportunity to do that. The only thing that would really be wrong, and I'm not a big fan of using even using that word with money, would be just to spend it. <laughs> um, because then when the payments do kick back in, it'll be a lot more painful and you've missed a, a key opportunity to possibly significantly change your financial wellness. Um, and it's also worth noting the current tax rates. <laughs> um, I am a CPA as well. I'm not a practicing CPA, but um, I have maintained that credential because I worked my butt off to get it. And uh, so I do keep up on what's going on in the tax world. And uh, most people don't realize that uh, the current tax rates are set to expire at the end of 2025. Um, and I'm sure that's going to happen, but there's a, even a possibility that tax rates could go up before that. And so now would be a good time to utilize the Roth IRA or even think about doing some conversions. If you have like a, a, a traditional IRA, maybe doing some conversions to Roth IRAs um, if the market were to drop again uh, to, to take advantage of the low tax rate and, and a quick conversion. Um, and then the other thing I, I'm just trying to, spread the word about is that there is this $300 charitable deduction for everyone that was it put in place for 2020. A lot of people didn't know that, but it actually was extended through for this year as well. So anybody can uh, deduct up to $300 worth of charitable deduction. So um, if you, you know, give money to your friends, um, marathon fundraising, or, you know, the local animal shelter, uh, as long as you have a receipt and there are 501c3 approved charity, you can actually deduct up to $300, even if you're not an itemizer. So minor, but hey, if you're even if you're in the 10% tax bracket, that's a 30 buck tax saving. So those are kind of the current things, but um, bigger picture, you know, the three pillars, paying off high interest rate debt, making sure you've got a cash cushion, and then of course, saving for the future. So that segues nicely into one of the questions that uh, some of the pre-registered people gave was, what's, what are some fun ways to save? Or maybe, maybe <laughs> even in the, the, the context, of, what are some ways that I can save that I don't really realize I'm saving? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. You know, well, first of all, I have to say there's a money mindset at work here. Um, I, was, uh, I inherited my father's money gene, which is frugality. Um, and that actually served me well when money was tight, especially in my first five to 10 years out of school. But as I became more um, affluent in terms of higher income, I actually, that mindset 
um, actually caused me some to make some bad financial decisions. So I would, I'm going to share some fun savings, like actual cash savings challenges, but I would encourage you to not, you know, I, it's a good idea to get into like a mindset of, of like trying to buckle down with money for a little while, but I actually would discourage people from trying to create this like overall overly frugal lifestyle, because even though this is a controversial opinion, but a, a lot of most of my profession would, would say, you know, skip the latte, skip the avocado toast. We've all seen the memes, you know, maybe the hedge fund managers should just stop eating avocado toast and going to Starbucks and then they'd be fine. Um, instead of that, that that's very popular advice. Um, and it works, but I think of it more like, um, you know, we tend to equate money and diets a lot the same. And I'm not a fan of, um, of restrictive intentional weight loss because uh, science shows it doesn't work. But when it comes to money, it does work if you do like a temporary fast. So like I always talk about doing a spending cleanse and I like it because it's temporary where you just say, I'm going to have like a no spend week or a no spend month. And that doesn't mean you don't pay your bills or you don't buy food, but it means more like when you go to Trader Joe's with your list, you don't like, you know, pick up spontaneous things from the end cap. Or when you walk into PetSmart to get pet food for your dog, you're not also buying them a spontaneous Valentine's Day, you know, treat or costume. So the, the no spend um, can really be a, another way to supercharge some savings goals or debt payoff, or even just a specific thing that you're, you a goal that you have, like going on a vacation um, when those happen again. <laughs> but, um, but I really like the idea of, of kind of challenging yourself and that the, the, the success of that really starts with knowing how much you don't spend. So, um, you know, knowing where your money is going, uh, for uh, another way to get more specific with that is I, I, I'm borrowing this from my friend, Andy, who's a financial advisor in Wisconsin. He says, um, his family, he has a large family and they go to the grocery store once a week and they know how much they spend on groceries. Let's say it's two fifty a week, which is actually kind of low for a larger family. So three weeks of the month, they go to the grocery store. And then one week out of the month, they don't. And they eat what's in the pantry, in the freezer, in the fridge. And after a while, that kind of doesn't work. But most of us have enough food in our house to skip the grocery store if we're in a routine of regularly shopping and get creative with the food in our, our pantry. And if we know how much we're spending on groceries on a weekly basis and we skip a week, then rather than just waiting to see if you actually have $250 left over, you can confidently know, I'm gonna take $250 and put that in my savings. And that's really kind of the bigger picture of any of these, any savings ideas is you can, you know, skip the latte or put yourself on a, you know, I'm gonna give up sweets for Lent and suddenly I'm not spending X dollars on ice cream and, and sweets, but then most of us just absorb that money into our other spending. So better way is to, if you're going to give something up in terms of your spending, determine how much you're actually spending on that and then deliberately put that in savings. And that's a risk-free way to make sure you're saving it, uh, literally saving it other than just not spending it on that thing. Um, and then like another thing I like to share is kind of in the, in the realm of fun um, is, and this is not as easy to do today in today's cashless society, but my mom never spends a $5 bill. So if she gets a $5 bill, she puts it in a special place in her house. I'm not going to tell you where, but that's her fun money. So when we go on a trip or when she, you know, her, somebody comes to visit and they want to go shopping or go to the casino, she knows she's got this money that has no other purpose and she never counts it. So it's just kind of there and it, her $5 bills, you know, that adds up pretty quickly. Um, I know I've known of other people to do that with a dollar bill. So that, that could work if you're a, a more of a cash person. Um, if you're more like me and a more of a type A money person where I actually balance my checkbook to the penny still. And I, you know, if you're a certain age or younger, you might not even know what that means, but I do think it's an important skill to have. I actually always round up when I put expenses into my checkbook. Um, so if it's, you know, $30 and 86 cents, I put in $31 and then I basically I'm saving the change And every couple months or so I reconcile and transfer that, that uh, excess into my savings. So again, a more cashless way to save money. And there are apps that'll do that for you as well. So those are some kind of little nice. ideas there. 
Yeah, thank you. So um, as far as savings, one of the things, and you tell me if this, if you think this is important, is trying to make it as automatic as possible so you don't mm -hmm. have to think about it. Um, I know for certain things, um, I happen to use uh, the Acorns app, which is yes. which is it rounds up and transfers in. Now, there's pros and cons to everything, but for me, you know, the you know seventy five cents change on you know purchase or whatever, or all the purchases that my family makes because they, or my wife and I on our debit cards all get rounded up and and dropped into that Acorns account. And I was kind of surprised at how much it's grown it, it's for as little as what I thought I was you know giving up true the acorns app is exactly what I was referring to in terms of rounding up um, now a few cautionary tales about that because I like people to know what they're getting into there is a fee right um, so I wasn't spending enough I didn't have enough transactions I guess to make it worth the fee and I also because the Acorns app does allow you to invest painlessly, that's awesome. But that gets into the rule of thumb about investing is you don't want to put anything in the market that you anticipate needing in five years or less. So if this is an account that you're going to use to like pay your car insurance or, or something, I wouldn't necessarily um, be putting it into the stock market. And one of the reasons it's done well is because the market's just, it's just defying logic these days um, or these, these years, I should say. So that, that, that can be a great benefit. And if you're, you know, don't need that money otherwise and can let it ride for years, that can be a great way to, to, you know, have your spending benefit you in another way. So you alluded to Roth IRAs and um, I, I, you know, here at the center, we refer to the Roth IRA as the unicorn because uh, I mean, there are very, very few things that have the benefits. And I, I would like, you know, you being the expert to be maybe explain a little bit because maybe some people don't know about that. But as far as uh, retirement and, you know, the tax savings and those sorts of things, are there things that people maybe aren't taking as much advantage of that they should be um, with regards to that area? And maybe you could allude to, uh, to some of those. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I love the Roth IRA, particularly for people who might have multiple savings goals because it can be used for more than just retirement. Um, the, the Roth IRA, as, as you may know, you can withdraw your contributions at any time. So you can put $6,000 in there and, you know, 10 years from now, if it's grown to $60,000, you can take $6,000 out without any penalties or taxes, but you can also withdraw up to $10,000 of your growth without taxes or penalties to buy a first home. So it can be, again, if you're going to plan to buy a house this year, not a great way to save because there's a risk of, you know, the, the trade-off of growing the money in the market's probably not there. But if you're just kind of thinking, yeah, I'd like to buy a house someday, um, but I'm not sure if I'm going to need to use my Roth IRA or not, why not put it in there, take advantage of the ability to save in there every year because there are annual limits and eventually there are income limits, although there's a way to get around those. Um, that is a, it's a great uh, for, for kind of possibly using for first time home purchase. And then the third thing is you can actually use your Roth IRA for qualified education expenses. So it can be a backup to college savings for your own children or grandchildren, or even a grad school degree in the long term term in the future for yourself or someone in your family. So it's, it is a unicorn because it's so flexible. So I would say the prioritize of money. Well, I actually, before I get into that, I should bring up the other one, the biggest retirement tax savings benefit. This is not necessarily the Roth IRA. It's the HSA, the health savings account, but that's not something that's available to everyone. Um, but if you're enrolled in a high deductible health plan, which I hate that, not that name, because it just implies, ah, I'm like, I could potentially be on the hook for all this money for my health care, but it, that's, that's the, how the IRS defines it. If you're enrolled in an HSA eligible health care plan, you can put money into your HSA and uh, it's tax deductible. And as long as you spend it on qualified medical expenses, the withdrawals are tax free and you can invent and you can invest it. And so I actually use my HSA as a, a backup retirement savings because you don't have to spend the money in it now on your current medical expenses. But if you change your mind, you can always go back and reimburse yourself. So what I mean is, um, you know, I really need to put this on LinkedIn, a post. Um, don't spend your HSA on little stuff <laughs> because you can always go back and reimburse yourself for it. Yeah, you can use it for 
a chiropractor visit or to buy, um, you know, birth control or menstrual products. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can use it for, but don't unless the alternative is putting it on a credit card and paying interest because that money can add up over time and it can be a huge uh, comfort in your later years. When you retire, for example, you can use it to pay for long-term care insurance. You can pay to use it to pay your Medicare premiums. Or once you're 65, it can just be withdrawn as a taxable withdrawal, like a 401k, and you can use it to buy a boat. Um, most people, you know, end up needing it for healthcare expenses. That's the biggest kind of question mark about our retirement expenses. But I'd say that's the biggest uh, thing that people miss. And hot tip, if you had an HSA for 2020 and you didn't get to the maximum, you can actually still catch up and put the full up to the full amount in if you can and increase your tax refund or, or reduce your taxes due. So as long as you fully fund your HSA by April 15th, you can actually deduct it from your 2020 taxes. So it's just a really great benefit. So in terms of prioritization, let's say, um, let's assume that you have a job with a 401k with an employer match. I would say put up to the match in your 401k or 403b. Um, so, you know, let's say 6%, if that's your match. And then I would say fully fund your HSA. So a lot of people um, don't understand that you can save beyond the match in your 401k. A lot of people think, oh, well, my employer match is 6%, so that's the maximum. No, 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 no. You can put up to $19,500 in your 401k um, if you're under the age of 50. So it's just the maximum that your employer will double or, or match or whatever your match formula is. But, but if you're saving beyond the match and you have an HSA and you're not maxing it out, I would actually divert those dollars to the HSA. They'll actually um, save more money because the HSA dollars are deducted before Social Security and Medicare taxes where your 401k is after. But that money is there for your future medical expenses or even ones that you're spending now. If you're just using your checking account, you can reimburse yourself. So it's just a really great benefit. Once you get to the maximum in your HSA, then I would say fully fund a Roth IRA. So then you've got that kind of more flexible retirement savings. The 401k has a lot more rules around being able to, to access it before you're 59 and a half. And then <laughs> if you've still got extra money you want to save, then I'd go back and save to the maximum in your 401k or 403b. And then after that, then we're talking about, you know, investing in taxable brokerage accounts and trying to build up a portfolio of, of money that's available at any time. Thanks. Yeah, those are great, great <laughs> suggestions. I like, I like the way you, that you prioritize because it can be a little bit overwhelming as far as if you're looking at all of these different things. So thank you. Um, so this segues nicely into a discussion about if, and, and we have quite a few people on the call, but, I, but one of the things that maybe is helpful is thinking about long-term and you talked about retirement and HSAs and those sorts of things. Maybe if you talk a little bit about how inflation impacts um, the uh, a person's long-term financial well-being and why people uh, why you should you know be aware and concerned about it, but also you know what is it you can do to um, mitigate the impact of that. So, oh well, so um, I did see one of the questions was you know how much what what should we use to calculate for 30 years? And kind of the rule of thumb's always been 3%, which is what I use. Inflation hasn't been 3% in over a decade. Um, it's averaged one, two, sometimes lower. Um, but, you know, you have to know how inflation's calculated. It doesn't include a lot of the things we spend our money on. And so if you are retired on a fixed income, or if you're, maybe your parents are, you probably know that like, there's still inflation. It's just on things that don't necessarily go into that, that percentage. Um, and the biggest things being healthcare, um, you know, personal services and food. So, um, you know, the biggest way to overcome inflation is to invest for the long term, and that's why the younger you are when you start investing, the more uh, of an impact it can have. Um, so, you know, you could save thirty dollars a month for your whole life, starting at the age of thirty, and if you stopped at forty-five you'd still have more money than somebody who waits till 45 to start investing and saves and, you know, invest till they're 65. They'd have to like save, save three times as much to match your balance, even if you stop. So, you know, if you're earlier in your career, I can't emphasize enough. And honestly, this is a mistake that I made. It wasn't until I was like 35 that I really fully comprehended what I was giving up by not 
saving more than the match in my 401k and taking advantage of the market. Luckily, I am a hands-off investor. So I had my 401k and IRA invested very passively and they had grown. But um, you, know, you can save, if you can save a higher percentage of your income when it's lower when you're younger, you can actually stop saving in those expensive spendy years when you've got kids in college and maybe you're looking at buying a second home and you want to do all that fun travel to celebrate your 40th year, 50th birthday, uh, and, and just kind of let your savings from your early years ride versus the calls that I always took where people celebrate their 50th birthday by calling a financial planner and panicking because they haven't started saving for retirement yet. It's so much harder to catch up and it's almost impossible and the way people often kind of mitigate that is they, they invest too aggressively and then they end up re with regrets and having to live a lower standard of living in retirement because they, they don't have as much saved as they could have. So, um, you know, I'm kind of going on a thousand tangents here, but the bottom line is inflation is, um, you know, there's, there's no way to predict what's going to happen. I can remember 15 years ago talking to a guy who had sold his business for 15 million and he was too worried about inflation to do anything but invest in bonds. And I mean, to his credit, he was like $18 million is enough for the rest of my life. But, um, and I don't need to take a lot of risk, but he was like, I'm just sure we're going to see double digit inflation in the next five years. And, you know, um, so far our, our monetary policy as a country has, has kept inflation pretty low. And that is a, that is a stated goal of the fed. So, I wouldn't expect to see inflation in the double digits like we did back in the 70s, um, but it's still good to you know, take advantage of that, that growth of the stock market to beat it, even if it does grow to be three or 4% as we use in our calculations. Oh, thanks. Yeah, um, it's interesting he chose bonds because bonds typically you know, have paid less than the stock market. And you know, he I'm, was, he wanted tips. So those are um, treasury oh, yeah. infl inflation protected. But I just remember that the guys I worked, I worked at a bank at the time and they made money based on how much his account grew. And they're like, it's not going to grow anything. Like, oh. <laughs> the client's always right. And he, he basically was like, I don't care if it grows. I don't care what inflation does. This is enough, which, you know, there's some yeah. peace in that. It, interesting, uh, you know, getting locked into, well, I, that probably points to another thing is don't get locked into a mindset you know, be, be a little open-minded as far as, you know, when people, you know, to different viewpoints, he, he obviously probably was suffering from confirmation bias and always looking for those things that confirmed that inflation was just around the corner. So, yeah. 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 I, I could, I could regale you with stories of this person. He was very unique for a long time, but, but <laughs> okay. yeah, I just always remembered that. Um, so uh, let's see. One of the things that uh, was a question uh, from one of the reg uh, registrants was, um, do you see any upcoming changes with a new administration and new priorities? You alluded a little bit to, um, you know, the the some of the tax things that are potential, um, and you know, with with some of the level of spending, I, I suspect maybe taxes might have to go up to help support. Uh, uh, some in, new programming and those sorts of things. But I don't know if you have any ideas or a crystal ball that you might be able to, to make some forecasts with. Yeah, I mean, it's all speculation. But, um, you know, generally speaking, when um, the Democratic Party is in power, it, it's more likely that tax uh, raising packages are going to be be passed or less likely that more tax cuts are going to be passed. Let's put it that way. Um, and you know, that all of the, the aid that we've had to pa hand out and the spending and um, even the tax cuts of the tax cuts and jobs act of 2017, those all have to be paid for eventually. So um, the, like I mentioned before that when the tax rates dropped in 2017, the actual law just, it was a temporary drop. And after eight years, tax rates are going to return to what they were in 2016. And so if nothing else, if Congress doesn't have to do anything and our tax rates are going to go up in 2025, not a lot, a couple percentage points, but still, you know, as my friend Mike likes to say, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye to pay 2% lower taxes on your income now than in now we're down to four years from now, those going up. But if, you know, because of the current uh, political climate, um, there, there would be more support for a tax increase even before that if we wanted to do something about the deficit. I honestly don't follow a lot of the politics of that stuff. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of, of 
you know, speculating and planning for all the things that might happen. But, um, you know, once the laws do pass, I, I read up and make sure I'm an expert on them. But I just say, the only thing I'd say is the taxes are definitely going to go up in our, you know, my working years. Um, and likely to be pretty much anybody on this call's working years, you're going to see higher tax rates. What they're going to be, you know, we've seen tax rates all over the place, even in my lifetime. So um, the biggest thing to think about is, and this kind of leads to one of the other questions, I'll kind of tackle that too, is, you know, ta distributions with tax strategy when you are in retirement is, um, you know, I could have, let's say, you know, my income's $80,000. That is, I believe, the 12% tax bracket. If I were single, <laughs> um, I don't have my tax brackets in front of me. It might be um, a slightly higher bracket. But uh, I could have an $80,000 income in 10 years and the tax rate be 50%. We just don't know. So um, I personally do have the opinion that my tax, my income rate right now will be taxed at a higher percentage when I'm in retirement. And so tax diversification of my savings is important. And that's why I have a Roth and I have a pre-tax uh, retirement savings and I have an HSA and I have non-retirement um, non investments as well. And um, there's a lot, of, a lot of tax planning that happens when you retire, particularly if you retire kind of at that traditional early 60s age um, and you, have, you factor in social security and how that's taxed. There are a lot of tax planning opportunities to almost pay no taxes in your 60s and 70s if you can do it right. And assuming that you have all those different buckets of money. Um, and I could do a 90 minute workshop on those strategies, but the bottom line is you wanna have different tax characteristics available so that you can piece together your taxable income in retirement versus you know, when you're working and you have a W-2 or you have a small business, you earn a dollar, you gotta pay taxes on it. Um, and there's not a whole lot of opportunity right now for working people to save on taxes or deduct unless you own a home or you give a lot to charity. But um, in retirement, because of the different tax characteristics of the savings accounts that you have available, there are ways to do a little bit more tax planning. Oh, okay, great. Well, at least people are aware that they need to be thinking about which bucket they're putting their money in because of the implication, you know, down the road. So um, that that's a good thing to know now. And as always, uh, you know, work with people who are experts in the area such that you're able to get the best information. So um, one of the questions that was uh, sent to us was um, about credit scores. And so if you if maybe you could just give a little bit of a basis of what goes into the credit score, but then what types of things to do to raise your credit score or work on improving your credit score might be helpful. I, I realize this is a little bit of a, of a, a segue away from the, the <laughs> uh, retirement planning, but, but it is something that affects everybody. So that this, this, I think is, is. It, it's super important. And it's even, um, it could be a money mindset thing because I have been in conversations with friends who are competing. Oh, my, my credit score is better than yours. And a credit score is important. A good credit score is important if you're planning to borrow money, particularly for um, leveraging. So leverage is when you borrow money and you use it to grow your assets higher. For example, um, in particular right now, assuming you buy in a high growth area, buying a home. So you can get a mortgage for like less than 3% in some places, depending if you have a good credit score. And as long as your home value grows at higher than 3% over the years, um, then you're, you're, you've leveraged that well. So a good credit score can help you, you know, buy a home, buy a car, um, qualify for 0% um, offers to, you know, buy a new refrigerator on credit. <laughs> um, and that, that's important. And also credit scores are important in federal jobs. And even in my industry, um, sometimes employers will look at your credit score. But, but a good credit score is made up of your credit report. So if you think of your credit report is like your homework that you do for a class, your score is your grade. And so the biggest thing you can do for a good credit score is pay your bills on time. That's the number, the highest ranked thing that goes into the formula. Now there are a variety of different credit score calculations. It's actually, there's not like a, a standard for credit scores. So um, some banks will buy from FICO. If you're buying a car, there's a certain FICO score because uh, the, and that FICO score prioritizes certain things and deprioritizes 
deprioritizes other things. A different score might be used for a mortgage versus um, the one that you can look up through your banking app. Um, you know, any if you have a credit card uh, with most of the major providers, they will give you your free credit score, which is helpful. But it might not be the exact same one that you would get if you apply actually apply to borrow money. You can access your free credit report to see what your homework says at the website annualcreditreport.com. Not not free credit report, that's, uh, you'll have to pay for it or, or sell your information. Um, annualcreditreport.com is where you can go to get all three credit bureaus reports on you. And that's an important thing to do. I actually, every four months, will just pull one, check for inaccuracies, make sure no one's stolen my identity. I know my stuff's out on the dark web because I get the notifications. Uh, there's not a whole lot I can do about it, but be vigilant. So you wanna make sure that there's nothing new on your report and um, just make sure that it's everything's kosher there. And um, like I said, paying your bills on time is the, the number one most important thing. So what the question was, you know, for college students, um, I've talked to so many young people who are lucky enough to graduate from college with no debt. <laughs> then they're like, I can't, uh, and especially um, that go to work for large consulting firms in the, at the time they're traveling and they're like, I want to get the Chase Sapphire card where you get a gazillion points and access to all the fancy lounges. And, um, you know, you get credit, you get points for doing just about everything you would do to travel for work. And they're like, I don't qualify because I don't have a credit score because I, you know, my parents saved money and paid cash for my college. So honestly, a small student loan actually helps your credit score. So even if you take out a stu student loan and pay it off immediately, that actually is a good way to establish yourself. Um, the other thing that um, parents frequently do is add their child as an authorized, authorized user onto one of their accounts. Um, and depending on the personality of the student, you may or may not disclose that to the student. So I could add my husband as an authorized user on my credit card, but he doesn't have to know that. I mean, he would see it on his credit report, but then he kind of gets credit for my good behavior. And that's another way to kind of give somebody a boost on their credit. Um, where that one goes wrong is when you co-sign for someone to allow them to get credit. And then that, and, and then if they pay it, it late um, or, or run, run the balance up and you're unable to pay it off and they're unable to pay it off, that hurts your score. So when you pair your, your credit history or your credit behavior with another person, then, you know, it's kind of like, their reputation can affect you. So um, again, it will depend on the personality of the person that you're trying to help um, as, as to how much access they give the, you give them to actually affecting your score. Um, and then one way that I built my credit score in college was when I moved off campus and um, had got roommates, I put the electric bill in my name and made sure it was paid on time every month. Sometimes that was involved knocking on people's doors at midnight, like you owe me money for the electric bill. <laughs> but um, that actually helped me have a record of paying things on time. So, you know, all your credit score is, is a way of saying like, this is a person who pays back what they say they're going to pay back when they say they're going to pay it back. But I wouldn't put so much weight on it being perfect if you're not planning to borrow money anytime soon. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, I, it gets a lot of play in the, you know, in the press and, you know, it's a number of people can gauge each other by. Um, and, uh, you know, as you said earlier, you know, some of those things that maybe don't get as much press, like your savings rate or, you know, those sorts of work. things it may, may have a bigger impact on your overall financial well-being than just a credit score. So, yeah. Um, there was an interesting question one, one person sent in was, what percentage of your net worth should be allocated to personal real estate? Or so, you know, in your total net worth, is there, is there a number that is advisable as far as what your home value should be relative to that? Honestly, that's what I would call BS beyond the scope of my expertise. <laughs> but um, I would say if, you know, I would personally never um, view my home as an investment. Uh, I've seen too many people think through, this is a great deal and buy a piece of property only to get burned. Um, they have, they're stuck living in a place that they hate because they thought it was a good deal. So, um, you know, I don't have a, an answer for that other than to say, when you're buying a home, think of it more as like, you have to, you're going to have a housing expense, no matter what, make sure that it's a place you're planning to stay for a while and that you have enough cash on hand to handle the maintenance and repairs that inevitably come up as homeowners, um, you know, up to 5% of the purchase price, depending on the age of the home. But um, 
I wouldn't actually, you know, a home is part of your net worth, but I wouldn't uh, include it as like part of the investment portfolio in terms of, you know, allocating 50% to U.S. stocks and 30% to international and 10% to bonds. Um, that, you know, I, that's my personal opinion. Yeah, I've, I've had family and friends who have uh, gotten into homes and, and been house poor, which uh, is, is kind of a rough a rough uh, situation in the sense that you begin to instantly hate this purchase because it, it just it deprives you of other things. So yeah, no, I appreciate Absolutely. that. We, we did have a comment in the chat and I, I think this is an interesting comment because it, it kind of gets to your little bit of your mindset about money. Um, somebody mentioned that isn't hiding the $5 actually um, losing money because uh, <laughs> your mom wasn't earning interest. And I'll let you answer it. I have a certain thought about this that probably is is running a little contrary in that because it was going to be spent, it really doesn't it doesn't matter. But uh, I'd like to hear your answer. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, technically, um, that money would be better off in the bank. Uh, in a bigger picture, maybe last year when she could have earned two percent versus you know 06 percent or whatever the highest interest rate. Uh, savings accounts are paying right now, but it's not a significant enough amount. And it's, it's, you know, for, for my mom, it's more just kind of an ongoing, like every six months or so she's spending it. So it, it doesn't make a huge difference, but if you were using this as a strategy to kind of build wealth or net worth, um, then yeah, I would say you should um, be putting that money into a, at least a high yield savings account until you've got your cash foundation and then ultimately putting it into, you know, the, the market through an index fund or, or into a retirement account. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so if people want to put questions in the chat, I'm more than happy to, to help feed those through. I've got a couple questions with regards to Oh, Todd, uh, sorry, one. I did get a direct question that I want oh, to take. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, so question is, you know, what, where can I go to learn more about all of this Roth IRA, 401k, um, you know, for people who are new to this? And I do have a resource for that. Um, the um, American Institute of CPAs is the kind of, kind of the American Medical Association for CPAs. They have a as a profession, um, our cause is financial literacy. So they have a website called 360 Degrees of Financial Literacy. It's 360finlit.org, 360finlit.org. Um, full disclosure, I actually contract with, with them and write a lot of the content on that website. So that's a great way to get more access to things that, uh, that I know and write, but that those are unbiased um, educational resources intended to help you learn more about that stuff. Cool. Thanks. That was going to be one of my questions was, is, you know, so um, from the standpoint of, of resources, one of the things that um, I get asked a lot here at the center about is different apps or, um, you know, tools that people use to, to try and get their personal finances in order. And there are a lot of free tools out there and some of them are, are quite good. And I didn't know if maybe you had ones that you've in your experience have found that have worked really well for people. Um, okay, so I will take the question that just came in about Credit Karma in the scope of this question, because um, I find apps to be helpful in terms of kind of providing you with baseline knowledge, but if it's, you're trying to change a habit, um, for example, a lot of people start off using Mint. Mint.com is a free budgeting website and app. It's owned by Intuit, which is also the company that owns TurboTax and QuickBooks. Um, it's not... I personally can't stand it because of but, uh, the limitations and you're basically selling um, your access to your spending behavior to them. And, and then they'll start like spamming you about student loan refinancing if you have student loans, but it is helpful if you find it to um, you want to like put together a budget or a spending plan and you have no idea where to start. Mint can be a really uh, easy and quick way to kind of get that look um, and then maybe for a couple months, you could set it up to ping you when you overspend in certain areas. But what I've found with almost no exception, anybody who uses it, eventually you just start to ignore those notifications. <laughs> so it's a good way to start a habit, but, but building that ongoing budgeting habit requires a little bit more. Um, you need a budget.com, Y, Y-N-A-B.com. That's a really, really um, popular and great 
app and service if you are ser- if you really do want to kind of be more type A about your money. I am a type B money person. I'm very type A in life, but um, I'm working on that. <laughs> but type B with my money, where I actually did the work uh, many years ago. Mint would be part of doing the work, looked at what my fixed monthly expenses were, anything that had a due date and a pretty reasonable, predictable amount. So my mortgage, my utility bill, my um, cell phone bill, all of those kind of monthly bills. And I set up an account where that money was automatically going into there and those bills were automatically paid every month. Now I check in on it at least once a month to make sure everything's happening right. And I still get the emails from all my providers saying this bill is going to come out on this date and I still track it all. That's my personal preference. How nitty gritty you get with it. But then everything else goes into my spending account and that, um, well, after I should say automatically money is going into savings. So, you know, when I was working at a job, it was 401k. I had a direct deposit going into it. My savings, I, I actually have several different savings accounts for different goals. So all of the leftover then goes into my spending account. And that's the only thing I have to check. So I just pull up my fifth third app, check to see how much money's in there. If I'm going to spend, um, I, I check that. So that's kind of more passive budgeting, but it does require a little type A behavior at the beginning to set it up. Um, but Credit Karma was a question. Is that a, is that a useful app? Because Credit Karma is an app. Um, and it, how accurate are their scores? Um, any banker will tell you they're not super accurate um, because they're not your FICO score. And, it, and a lot of people are disappointed when they come in, well, Credit Karma says my score is this. And then it's like, you know, 20 points lower and they can't get the loan. But Credit Karma is really helpful if you are trying to build credit or you have had something um, you know, in your past that you're not sure, like your credit score is low and you're trying to fix it. Credit Karma will help tell you what to do to fix it. And it's also a good way to monitor your identity. So there, there's some value there, but I wouldn't rely on it as, um, you know, can I afford to, to buy a car based on this credit score? Probably better to um, actually talk to a banker about that to see kind of what your, your chances are and what, what rates you might qualify for based on your exact credit history. Okay, we do have a question in the, the chat that I think is really good. It, uh, it, they've all been great, but this one I think is really pertinent. Uh, what are some of the fundamental financial mistakes people make? And I don't know if you have like a top three, top five, a David Letterman top 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, could we have another hour? No, I'm kidding. Um, back when I worked at Financial Finesse, I wrote for Forbes and the most popular post I ever wrote was the five mistakes millennials make with their money. Um, and I'll try to remember because it was a couple years ago that I wrote it, but the num- one of them was um, investing too conservatively when you're young. So um, a lot of, especially in our culture of young people now, there's this perfection uh, tone. You know, in fact, I, I try not to even use the word perfect when I'm scheduling a meeting. Oh, perfect. Like, no, it doesn't have to be perfect. We want to get things right. We've been trained to get things right. You know, get the good grade, get the uh, scholarship you know, get the good job. Um, and we tend to want to make sure we don't get investing wrong. And it can appear that we get investing wrong if we invest and our account goes down in value in the short term. You've got to like set it and forget it and not look. Investing, the, the only wrong thing you can do when investing is not doing it. So um, one of the, you know, uh, mantras is it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. So just being too conservative and, and trying to beat the market is a huge mistake that people make. Um, I would also say, um, oh, you found it. <laughs> well, let's look at it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I would also say, um, you know, prioritizing paying off student loans um, when they have other, other things going. Like I, I just see so many people, um, the media has told us that student loans are bad. It's holding people back from getting married and buying a house and having babies, all the things we want to do as adults. And you're like, oh my gosh, I have this big, you know, $50,000 that I owe. And uh, if I don't pay that off, I can't get, I, I, I'm not able to do anything I want to do in life. Uh, check yourself on that. Because if you're, if you can get your student loan interest rate to 5% or less, and, and then any extra money you would pay towards that you're investing for the future or saving or paying off higher interest rate debt, and just keep paying the minimum that you owe on your student loans. Treat it like a mortgage because really your student loans bought you an amazing education from an outstanding educational institution. That is an investment. So paying it off, as long as you're not paying astronomical interest rates is not so bad. 
So don't be so focused on um, being anxious about paying them off unless it's truly a financial hardship to make your payments. Um, and then, you know, just not paying off your credit cards every month. Uh, a lot of people just kind of willy nilly will carry a couple thousand dollars all the time on their credit cards, not realizing how much an interest that's costing them. Um, there are ways to make money using credit cards. Uh, you know, that's, that's not my specialty, but there are some really great blogs out there that'll tell you how to, you know, travel hack and take advantage of, of all that stuff. I do all of my spending on two credit cards. <clears throat> my husband and I have a joint card, Capital One Saver card. It gives us cash back for dining out, entertainment and groceries. That's all we really spend money on. Um, and then I personally, I have the US Bank Cash Plus card where I can pick my categories and I get incented for like fitness payment, uh, fitness classes, which is where I like to spend a lot of my money. <laughs> um, so, but I, we pay those off every month and we prioritize that because if we didn't, we'd be paying like 18% interest. So, um, you know, not, not making the most of credit card rewards would be another mistake, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of, I'll, I'll take Chris's question, should I pay off a credit card rather than save? Um, it depends on the rate. So if you can get uh, a 0% interest rate, then, um, and you don't yet have at least $1,000 in savings or, or a cushion to get you through a disruption of an income, then, then um, you know, I would pay it off every month. But if you have a balance that you can't pay off right now, then uh, make sure you've got a nice cash cushion to weather your emergency fund. It's all about interest rates. So, um, you know, what would you do with the money otherwise? If you're just going to spend it, then I would pay off the credit card. If you're going to use it to uh, pay down your mortgage, um, I'd probably pay off the credit card because the credit card's probably at a higher interest rate. If you're going to save the money in your 401k or in a Roth IRA or even just in the market, then I would invest it. Cool. Thank you very much, Kelly. I really appreciate <laughs> all you taking the time. Um, I, I know there's a lot here. Um, so uh, from the standpoint of advice to give people on ways to, to go out and do that, I think you gave them the AICPA resource. Um, and I think that's a great place to start. So um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I know I will be uh, checking out that website you sent for sure. So, <laughs> And I also... Um, I blog on Medium and um, I tend to write more about the psychology of money stuff. So if any of anybody's a subscriber to medium.com, um, that's also a, you know, a place to get some of my thinking on a regular basis. Um, I've already been reading that too. It's a, free, it's, a, it's a free blogging site and you can read up to five articles per month, I think for free. But um, yeah, I, I, it's just medium.com um, and my username is KCL Money Coach, my initials Money Coach. Well, thank you. I just wrote to Todd and told him I could just sit here and listen for hours and have a notebook full of notes already. So we really appreciate you being here. And to those who joined us, thank you all for joining us. I think um, we have actually, we're, we're doing another one of these next week, focused specifically on retirement and basic investing. And I think Eric is with us here. So he is a financial advisor here in Kalamazoo and he is going to uh, join us next week. So those of you who are here, if you're interested, feel free to sign up for that one too. Um, but again, Kelly, thank you. I uh, Maybe I'll Eric can answer the question you. about personal, personal real estate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I actually meant to, to plug that, like it, all the investing questions, not my expertise. I'm a passive investor, but I'm sure he can uh, take that one for sure. Yeah, we'll bombard him with some of those next week too. So, um, well, I will, I think probably some people have to hop off. So feel free to go when you need to go, everyone. Um, but keep an eye out for more of these and we will make sure you get invitations to this kind of thing, but thank you all for coming. And Kelly, Todd, thank you too. I could not have done that without you because. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So um, the, the only thing I would say is to everybody um, as an alumni, uh, you know, 
we are here at the Sanford Center. So if you know of students who are current students who need assistance or want to come in and talk to somebody about getting some financial coaching, we're here to help. We also will help students refer out to people who are either licensed or specially trained in, in fields that uh, we don't cover. So we, we do make referrals out. So we would be glad to help.